All right. Hey, go ahead and grab your Bible. It's so great to worship the Lord with you all today. Such a sweet day and a beautiful day outside, I think. Uh, I look forward to getting out today. Maybe you will as well. But hey, all of you online as well, we're, we're, we're grateful that you're here. We're coming to the home stretch, kind of, of, of what we call uh, Philippians, the book of Philippians. It's a letter to the church in Philippi, early believers here. Um, and I often wonder about the context. It's important to understand, like, who were these early, you know, first readers? What were they thinking? What was their life like? And it's very different than ours. But today we're, we're getting into chapter four. Um, which is an incredible passage there. We're right in the middle of chapter four. We'll get there in a moment. Um, we've been talking about all things new has been the title of this whole series, uh, how in Christ we've got a new, we, new ambition. We've got a new, new life. He's given us a new heart to start with. And today we're gonna talk about a new focus. Um, Han kind of led us to this idea. It was uh, John Mark Comer who pointed me to Mary Oliver, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning poet, who, who said, uh, attention is the beginning of devotion. Now, that sounds real simple, right? But it is a powerful concept. When I read that, I thought, wow, wait a minute. Focus is the beginning of worship. Focus, think about it. Focus is the beginning of love. I mean, if you're not focused on someone, giving your attention to them, their needs, what they're really thinking and feeling, some empathy towards them or anything, you can't love that person or thing. To bring your attention to it, is the first step towards you know, giving uh, all of your, your love and your heart to that thing. Well, here's the thing, of course. Uh, everything starts in the mind. We're gonna be talking today about the mind. This is gonna be such a helpful message, real practical message today. And, and all of, everything, you know, our attention, our focus, this is where we struggle. This is where I'm thinking about the first hearers. What did they have coming into their minds? Like we have this barrage of data and information coming to our minds constantly. Now, through technology and whatever, and now I'm thinking, well, they didn't have, they didn't have like screens. They didn't watch television. They didn't, they didn't have phones. They didn't have any, what, what was coming into their minds? And we have this greater challenge today. In fact, lead researchers, experts in the field of cognitive neuroscience have determined that the average person has 6,000 thoughts a day. Now, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I read this and I'm, I'm delving into this research and I think, I'm like, I'm thinking, Stacy always accuses me of like, you're thinking all the time. You know, I'm like, well, I, like, how do you not have thoughts? Like, all, like we have thoughts. Like, I'm, I'm thinking, like, isn't it a billion thoughts a day? But here's what they've done. It's a team of, of psychology experts, okay? And, and this, this, this statistic comes from what they've developed, never before seen way to detect when, when a single thought, a focused thought, leaves the mind and another, another thought begins. They call them thought worms. And there's a focused time. They've, they're able to uh, kind of adjacent points of activity in the brain, the patterns in the brain. The, re, the new research focuses on how human consciousness flows consciously from one thought to the next. Now, the great challenge for us today, again, is technology, right? And digital capitalism. I mean, if, if, a, if a company can get your attention, right? They want your money, but before they get your money, they've got to get your attention. They got to get you to focus on their product, right? Ultimately, attention equals money. And so now we have attention experts. How can we capture people's attention and all the algorithms and all that, that comes into play there? But here's the thing I want you to hear today. Satan wants your attention in the same way. And he is wiser, he's slicker, he's smoother than any advertising firm out there. And if, even in me saying that, if you think, well, Halloween's coming up, and I like, get the image of some you know, guy in a red suit, and poor, you know, uh, pitchfork, and he's walking around. No, no, no. There are evil forces in this world, that, and it is why you have a hard time focusing. And you may say, oh, I thought that was ADD. I thought, no, I'm talking about not focusing on what really matters in your life. There's an evil force at work in our lives, and we need to address that. We need to recognize it, because the lies that we Come to believe we begin to live out. Lies about our identity, lies about purpose of life, lies about God and who he is or who he's not, lies about other people. There is a disinformation campaign that's taking place and Satan is behind it all. And when that comes into a society like we've seen in recent years, it is societal suicide is what takes place when we start to believe lies. And we, we see this polarization in our culture today. 
And it is because there is an evil one at work. Satan is scheming, all right? God's word is where we find the truth. Christ is Lord. His people are prevailing as long as we stay focused. I read that in the year 2000, before the digital revolution took place, our attention span was 12 seconds. Now, we don't have a lot of margin here, but Steve Jobs then introduces the iPhone into the wild, 2004. And everything changes. Now our attention span, it's dropped to eight seconds. So I've got quite a task here this morning. I'm, I recognize that. I started, like I could break into a dance or something every eight seconds or do something crazy. Um, but, but here's the thing, to put this in perspective, the goldfish attention span is nine seconds. We're losing. The goldfish, all right? Everyone is vying for our attention. And, and, and again, a company can get your money only if they get your attention. In fact, Microsoft researcher Linda Stone says this, continuous partial attention is now the new normal. Continuous partial attention. Can I, and, and be careful, like I was about to say, can I get an amen? Some of you spouses are sitting there going, yeah, that's, that's what's up right here. Like, did you hear what I said? Did you even hear me? Of course I heard you, honey. I was, I was, I'm right here. Constant partial attention. And it is killing your soul. We've got to learn how to focus our hearts and our minds. So that's our, our focus today, right? A new focus. We need to think differently. We're called to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength you are the sum of your thoughts. I would say you're the sum of your thoughts, your intentions, and your actions. In fact, the Bible says that what you can say what you believe, but it's what you do that proves what you believe. What you do is what proves, is what proves your mind is attached to, right? And, but here's the good news. Here's the good news. As we focus on Christ, and we're gonna, we're gonna talk about how we do this today. What do we focus on? And we're gonna talk about how we can live lives that are filled with hope, filled with love, and filled with beauty. We need more of that in our world today, and it all begins in your little world, in your mind. Because in 1 Corinthians 2.16, Paul says, we, those of us who've received Christ, okay, who, um, I'm not, gonna, not necessarily presuming that upon everyone here, but if you're like me, and you've responded to his grace by faith, what Christ has done on the cross for you. He's forgiven me of my sin. He's taken the punishment of my sin upon himself. He's, he's given me now this heart transplant. I have a new heart. I'm now trying to live this out, what he's done in me. He's lived the perfect life for me. I don't have to live perfectly because he's already lived perfect, but I'm seeking to live that kind of life. If you're like me and your whole life is given over to him, the Bible says we have the mind of Christ we have the mind of Christ. We can think like him. The whole process of sanctification, you see, is becoming like him, and it begins in the mind. Everything starts in the mind. I want my mind, friends, is this your, is this your hope and goal? I want my mind to be completely captured by the thoughts of Christ. How do you do this? I want to give you some practical steps that are going to come in the form of questions today. He's given us a new heart. So we can capture our hearts to become like Jesus. If you apply this message, it'll change your life. I'm telling you, this passage is so, so uh, relevant for us today. Paul's been talking about anxiety. If you were here last week, if you weren't, you need to check it out. We were talking about how to overcome anxiety and the answer to it all. No, I should say a means towards an end is prayer. He says, if you're an be anxious for nothing, but instead... Pray, And we said that prayer is what then gets us into the presence of God that provides the peace of God, which comes from the God of peace. We actually enter into his presence, and that's where the peace comes from. So Philippians 4, 8, and 9. You can turn there if you haven't already. Uh, you can grab your Bible. I'll show it on the screen, but you can follow along with me. I want to encourage you to take notes today. Um, you can do it on your phone if you didn't bring something to write. But uh, I want to encourage you to take notes because here's how I want you to do this. I want you to apply this. So stop and think about your life, maybe some, some decisions you're seeking to make. What's the biggest decision in your life right now? Uh, something will apply here. Uh, maybe you're struggling in a relationship with someone. Maybe you're seeking to make some decisions around your family, your finances, or your work. Maybe you're, you need to forgive someone. Maybe there's somebody in your life and it's like, man, I need to love that person well. 
Uh, I'm really struggling there. This is going to help you a lot. So I'm going to read the two verses, and uh, then we'll jump in. All right? So here it is, verse 8. And now, I'm reading from the New uh, Living Translation. Dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. So your, yours might say, finally, uh, this. This is second finally, by the way. This is like a good preacher. Like, okay, last point. You're like, no, he's going another 10 minutes. Okay. Um, finally, and no, finally, as I land this, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then Okay, here it is. Then the God of peace will be with you. Paul gives us the antidote for a worried, hurried, wasted life. And it all starts here in the mind. So we're breaking it down this way. We're going to ask the question, two questions. The first one is, is it worthy of praise? All right? Is it worthy of praise? Because if you've received Christ, again, like me, if you're a Christian, and you've given your life over to him. Our lives now are one, what I say, one big hallelujah back to him. Everything we do is an act of worship. Hallel is praise, Yahweh. Praise be to God, my life is one big hallelujah. And it starts in the mind. So is it worthy of praise and is it worthy of practice? This is how he kind of breaks this down for us. Is it worthy of praise? If it is what Jesus would think about, then we're gonna live like him. See, the whole challenge here, if you're new, and I've met a lot of new people already today, if you're new here, we're about one thing. We're all about Jesus, okay? And we're all about, as we respond to his grace, to become apprentices under our rabbi Jesus, our shepherd Jesus. Disciples is what we are. So to be a disciple of Jesus, this comes into play with this teaching today. We need to be with Jesus. First step, be with him. Become like him, starts in the mind. Become like him and do what he would do if he were us. That's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. So I gotta ask you honestly, before God Almighty, are you walking that kind of life? Are you with him? You say, well, I think he's with me all the time. He says, pray without ceasing. I think, I, get, I got that, he's with me. No, 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 no. I'm talking about, are you focused on him? Are you bringing your focused attention to him? And I believe that needs to happen uh, at least a single time in a day for an extended period of time, and it can happen then throughout the day. We're gonna talk about that today. Are you spending time with him to be conformed, to become like him? Are you fixing your thoughts on him? Now, the key to this passage is, is really a single word. Uh, actually, it's translated a couple, maybe a couple words to make it, make it fit within our understanding, but the Greek word is logizomai. Um, everybody say logizomai. Logizomai. Okay, you can press your friends later, talk about this, because logizomai is the word that's translated think. Okay, think on these things. Think on these things. Dwell, meditate. Often it's, it's translated think. I'm choosing the word focus, because the verb form here, Paul is saying, keep on focusing. It's like a loop in the mind. This is the thought worm that these researchers are talking about. It's, it's what we keep coming back to. This focus of the Christian mind is to dwell, to focus. It's the constant mental loop in your mind. Okay, logizomai is to meditate on it, it's to reckon. It's where, it's over and over again in the New Testament. It's used in a lot of different ways, but it's thought patterns. It's internal, it's the internal narratives that you're playing in your mind all the time and all day long. Let, let these categories, okay, these categories, he says, he says, whatever things. And you know what I mean? Like, well, think about whatever. He means whatever fits in these categories, think on these things. That's how this plays out. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to break it down. Okay? Again, with you, with the self-analysis throughout, Paul says, make sure your mind is fitting and your, your thoughts are fit in these categories. And I'm going I'm to do it in the form of questions throughout. All right? So is it true? Is it true? Notice, it all begins with truth. Why? Because so many lies are coming at you all day long and all of the time. And I'm not just talking about advertisers or what you're hearing on you know, fake news or whatever else or biased reports on what's happening. I'm talking about satanic 
evil thoughts that come into your mind that do not match up with the word of God. Satan is the father of lies. Every time he speaks is a lie. And, it, and also scripture says God cannot lie. He, what he speaks is always truth, okay? This polarization we see in our, in, our, in our society is because we're not captured by the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and what? The truth shall set you free. Free from what? Free from the lies that lead to slavery and, and evil thoughts, negative thoughts, satanic thoughts, uh, false identities, becoming cynical, becoming angry, contentious, mad, anxious, all the things. Jesus says, and, the, and he says, listen, you know the truth, and the truth is going to set you free from everything else. It's going to liberate you, the, and God's word is the truth. Another key question, are you in the word? That's where you find the truth. Are you spending time with Jesus and are you spending time listening to him and focusing on who he is? How do we know who he is? His word tells us. His word tells us. By his spirit, the word of God speaks to us. Are you spending time daily in the word? Do you need to spend more time in the word? Do you need to have, you know, maybe you're like me. You got a pattern every morning, every day I'm in the word. And you might say, well, I'm glad my pastor's in the word. No, no, no. This is a call for every one of us. And, and, and what God is teaching me is I need not simply to have silent moments before him in his presence, but I need to do it throughout the day. I talked about this last week. There's ways to do that. Just sitting in your car before you jump out to the next thing, right before another meeting. You arrive somewhere early. Slow down. A hurried mind is a mind that is captivated by the things of this world and by the flesh by the devil, and it's not the things of the, word, of, of the word of God, the truth of God. You know, it's popular in our world today. We, we talk about it often, um, that you know, there is no truth, right? And this really is what guides a lot of people. There's, there's no absolute truth. We've seen this coming for years. There's no truth. Now, if, if that statement's true, then it's not true. But anyway, you can talk about that at lunch. Um, so so it, it's popular to say there's no truth, and, and, and yet... We all know that there is truth, that it's the word of God that guides us. In fact, the truth today in the secular schema, the secular gospel is, if it doesn't make me feel good, it's not true. Like, like now you're telling me something that's gonna, I have to adjust my life, change my life. That's not gonna make me feel good, and so it can't be true, right? So the secular gospel says, whatever you know, makes me feel good is salvation for me. And apart from God's word, we, we, we'll all follow that. The secular golden rule really is follow, follow your heart. But the Bible said the truth is, Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful in all its ways. There is no cure for it. It's evil. And, and we're not to follow our hearts. We're to follow the truth. Is it true? Think on the truth. Here's something else that has helped me a lot in my own personal life, wrestling with things. Am I being honest with myself in a situation you're dealing with? And you, if you want to know, then talk to others. Am I being honest with myself? Is this, is this true about me, what I'm dealing with here? And I always add, is, am I being honest with myself? Really? <laughs> really? God's word will help align me to that. Others in my life who love me will help me to be accountable. Is it true? All right, that's the most important one. Spent some time on that one. All right, is it honorable? Is it worthy of all? Is it the opposite, really, of common and mundane? That's another way to think about these words, because not all these are words we use a lot, which is, probably tells us something. The things that we focus on, is it, is it venerable, is, the, is another translation, a word we don't use. It means worthy of respect. Does it deserve honor? Does it stop me in my tracks? Is it worthy to focus on? Honorable thoughts lead to an honorable life. And then, is it just? Is it just? It, this means righteous. It's the interchangeable word, righteous. Evaluate what you're allowing into your mind by asking, will it bring about the justice of God? This takes humility. Are my thoughts about the way things ought to be? Not all the negative stuff of the way that everybody's telling me the way it is or the way it's going. If we, you know, if you vote for this person or this, this, this happens and we do this, then it's all gonna go that way. And it's, it's so negative. The news that we hear is negative. Is it just, is it bringing about Fair and equitable thoughts in my mind. Am I being impartial? Righteousness demands a humility before God, right? Look, at it is, pure. is it pure? 
How does a young man keep his way pure? Psalm 119, 119.9. How does a young woman keep her way pure? How do you live a pure life? And it says, by obeying, knowing and obeying the word of God. That's how you keep your life pure, focusing on his word. And there's so many things coming into our lives. We could talk a long time about this. So much that's coming to our minds that is impure. Through our screens, uh, through, through our phones, our apps on our television. What are you putting into your mind? You say, well, it's not, 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 not that big a deal. I mean, like, I don't watch the really hardcore stuff. I don't do that, but I, you know. What are you bringing into your mind? Because for many of us, our technology is almost like this sewage pipe that's just running into our, our families, uh, into our homes, into our minds, and it's just pouring this impure thoughts constantly. When we, and if you don't have guards around your computers, friends, if you have children, teenagers, and you're not putting protections and guards, blocks around your phones and your, all of your devices, then you're just allowing this sewage to just come into the minds of your children and into your mind. Is it pure? Are you guarding your heart? Is it lovely? I love this. Is it beautiful? Is it full of love? Are my thoughts toward that other person? Full of love. You say, well, I don't like them. That No, no, we're, we're called to love even our enemies. And here's another question I like to ask. What does love require of me in this situation? What would love require of me? What would it mean to love here? See, the good news is we bring our thoughts to Jesus, focus on him, we behold him. Not only is it formative, but it's beautiful. Life is lovely. And beautiful when we bring our attention to him because he is the most beautiful one of all. Is it commendable? What you're thinking about, is it admirable? Is it of good repute? Another translate, good, re, good repute, good report, or a good reputation. Is it a general good thing to think about? And, and I think I'd say it this way. You know, I heard, I heard years ago, you, you take care of your integrity, your thought life, and your reputation will take care of itself. Is it of good repute? Is it commendable? Here's another good question. What story am I trying to tell with my life or, or with the decision you're wrestling with right now? What would be the story told about this decision? Like with my kids or my grandkids or my friends in years to come, look back on this decision. What would be the story told about that decision I made and why? It's another good, it's, is, is it commendable? Is it excellent? One of the ways to parse these out is to consider the opposite. Is it awful? Is it common? Is it mundane? And listen, you can spend hours again just scrolling through whatever, whatever's a mess, whatever's off, whatever's mind-numbing, meaningless, and you can waste your life doing that, focused on things that do not matter. Is it excellent? And then look, he closes with, is it worthy of praise? Isn't that a great way to wrap it up? He's saying, is it worthy of praise? We talk about this all the time. Jesus said, wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart will be right? Whatever you think is praiseworthy, that's where your attention, your focus, ultimately your energies and your your money, your thoughts, your actions will run. We often define treasure as time and money. But I, I think today, you know, at a base level, we could say the most precious resource you have is your attention. Where are you bringing your focus? Here's what I'd say in, in, at the end of it all. Your heart will follow your Focus, you say your heart, your heart will follow your focus. Your life will be shaped by what you focus upon. I think we've made that clear today. Attention, awareness of his presence is what's so important. The problem in this relationship is not God. He's in the present now. He's always with you. He's never far from you. The problem is us in our unawareness, our lack of attention and focus on his presence in our lives. So much is at stake here, friends. So much is at stake for us to discipline our minds. How can we stay focused, all right? Just to get real practical here, we practice spiritual disciplines to position ourselves to be in his presence and to hear from him. This means slowing down. We've talked a lot about this recently. This is something I'm practicing. Again, if I'm gonna follow my rabbi Jesus, I'm gonna be with him. What does that look like? I think it looks like slowing down. It looks like Psalm 46, verse 10, that says literally, let your hands hang down. And know that he's God. Be, be quiet. Stop. Stop. You know how you enter into soulful rest, peaceful rest in your life? By resting. That's how that happens. How do you come into his presence and focus? By focusing 
and saying, Lord, here I am. I want you to practice this in your quiet time. Come before the Lord and spend five minutes. It'll feel so weird at first. Lord, I'm just, I'm here. I'm not gonna do this study and I'm not gonna tell you all my thoughts. I'm gonna, I'm just here in your presence and I'm gonna focus on your love for me right now. Lord, remind me again of how much you love me. We just think on that and just be quiet before him. Just quiet. And, and I follow really three steps here. Stop, look, and listen. I've talked about this before, but just stop. Really stop. Don't focus on anything. Stop. If you need to close your eyes, be just quiet before him. Look, meaning look into his word. Look at his word and listen. You say, I don't know where to start in the word. I don't know what to. Listen, we have resource guides for every sermon we're preaching. It's out there on the web right now. You can go there. It has questions. Unpacks this whole, uh, this whole passage, this whole sermon. And you can do that every week. You can spend every day doing this. Look into his word and then seek to listen to what he's telling you. We say it this way. What is God saying to you? What are you going to do about it? Because that's where the power shows up. And then what uh, or who will you tell? Who might need this word of encouragement? All right. So look at what he says here. Is it worthy of praise? And then finally, we'll wrap up with is it worthy of practice? Briefly. In verse 9, he says, keep putting into practice... I love how this is practice, like a rule of life. It's like patterns, rhythms. Practice these things. All you have learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and, and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. I love that. See, the end game here, we're, we're, the, we're not the sum of our intentions. We are the sum of our actions. We're the sum of what we practice. Show me what you're practicing. Show me your habits. I will show you who you're becoming. I will, uh, this is the, the person that you are. And see what happens when we come before God and we start to think about, I hope this has happened today, conviction of the Spirit. With all these things, is it, is it commendable? What I'm thinking about, am I, am I disciplined in my life? Am I focused? Because something in my life needs to change. Friends, something in your life needs to change today. And here's my, here's my concern for us as my, my flock. When you come before God's word in this moment, when you come to church or you open his word, you come into connect group or into your small group, you come to a sermon. And if you don't come with a posture towards doing something, not only have you wasted your time and my time, frankly, love to see your face, love to see you, I love you, but something will happen in your heart. Something starts to happen in your heart. James says, if you're not a doer of the word, you're just a hearer. You deceive yourself and you think that just hearing the word preached and taught, wow, Jeff studied this. My pastor knows this passage. Wow, no gids am I. Man, I'm gonna press my friends. This is great. I love going deeper in the word. And you do nothing. Your heart will become hardened. And this is my great concern for us as God's people, that we think we can look at the word and just study it and get to know it as if learning is the end game when in reality it's the spiritual formation that I become like Jesus when I actually do and live like him. Starts with thinking like him. And then finally look at the presence. I mean the promise is the present. Promise. Then the God of peace will be with you is what he says. Friends, so much anxious thoughts we have. But here's the thing. What Paul has done here, he does this other places. He is a painter. This is why I love him. He's an artist. He does it with words. And what we have here is a portrait of Jesus. He says, look at him. He is the way, the truth, and the light. He is what is true. Look at him. Behold him. He is the one of supreme honor. He is just. He is pure. He is love personified. He's the one worthy. He's commendable. He is excellent. He is beautiful. And he loves me. And I just fix, look, this is why Hebrews 12, 2. We'll close with this. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. The author and perfecter of our faith. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross. This is the expression of his love for us. Despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He is our victorious Savior. Now, I thought about this, and I'll wrap up with this. Finally, brothers and sisters, um, I thought, how cool would it be today, beautiful day outside, that we could be together like all day. 
In fact, I thought, it'd be really cool. Let's all be together all week long. Now, you didn't know this was going to happen, but I have a, a way for us all. We're going on a retreat, entire church family and friends. Y'all can join us. We're going to go down to the beach because we just need to go to the beach. But, but here's what I want to do. I, I want us to, to count sand just to make a point. Because we've thought a lot about what we are to think about, what fills our minds. But it got me thinking, Psalm 139 says that God has more thoughts about you than there are grains of sand on the planet. So I thought we'd all go down. Where do you want to go? Cabo. We're going to go to Cabo. I heard Cabo. <laughs> we'll go to Cabo. I'm going to put you all up. This is amazing because you all are so generous. We're going to take a portion of our budget and do this. <laughs> Not even close. Um, I'm, I'm going to pay for it. In this story, I'm paying for this myself. I'm really excited to do this. Um, we're going to all go, and we're just going to take a swath. Like we're going to stay in really nice, you know, um, play, you know, the resort. and all. We're going to take just a swath, just a portion of the beach because we only got a week. And I'm going to give you all a bucket. We're all going to go out, and you can bring family, friends. And we're going to each take a bucket. We're going to go out, and we're going to, we're going to grab some sand, and we're going, to make, we're going to make sure we got one grain of sand. We're going to... One. Let's go. All right. Let's keep it rolling. Jeff wants to do this like for a week we're doing this. Okay. Two. Hey, this is good. We're going. I mean, right? How crazy is that? Begs the question, what is he thinking about you? What is he thinking? And I'm here to tell you today, because I know the truth of God's word. He loves you. And not only does he love you, he has lovely thoughts toward you. He likes you. Like he wants to be with you. He longs for you to be in his presence. He wants to cover you in your grief. He wants to comfort you in your loss. He wants you to come to him. He wants you to think about him because he's thinking about you all the time. This God who's created you, he's saying, I've made you for my purposes. Come to me. Come to me. And I will show you what it is to calm your anxious thoughts, to focus on what is lovely, what is pure, what is right, what is true about you. Friends, will you commit today to giving me life? I want us to just, let's bow our heads now and close our eyes and just commit to focusing your mind on him this week. It might mean turning off your phone, turning off the television, being his word instead of watching your net, the net, next foot, Netflix thing you got going or some series or whatever else you got. Be in his word. Spend time every day. Would you commit today, right now, to get up in the morning and come before him, even if it's for three minutes, five minutes of silence before him. Say, Lord, I'm here. I'm fully present today. And you're already waiting for me. What will it be for you? Maybe you need to tell someone. That's always helpful, right? Tell someone. Now, commit to tell someone to be accountable. This is the thing. This is what I'm doing. This one habit will change my life. And for those of you who've never received Christ, today is your day. It's why you're here. Focus your heart on him. He has focused his affection and his attention towards you. And in his divine mind, one of the faces that he saw while on the cross was yours. And it was enough to kill him. Because he wants to be with you. Receive his grace right now by faith. Lord, come into my life. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I give you my life. Lord, we love you. We bring our attention to you to be fully devoted to you. We focus on you now and throughout every moment of this day and throughout the week to worship you with our lives. It's in your name we pray. Amen.